Johnson. So welcome to the second of our four guests today. I'll be speaking with uh, Professor Tony Bendell, who's going to talk to us about the anti-fragile organisation. But before I do that, I'll give you a very short introduction about myself. My name is Mark Buchan, Managing Director of the Agile Leader, author of Leaders is Not How You Finish, It's How You Start. I'm a leadership and culture specialist, executive coach consultant with over 20 years experience helping organisations become more agile and troubleshooting agile transformations. I now train and develop agile, aspiring agile leaders. You can find out more information about me and other speakers today on the contributor section of the Transcending the Crisis website. So that's enough about me. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Tony, Professor Tony Bendel. Um, Professor Tony Bendel is a leading figure in the emerging field of anti-fragility. He's chairman of the Anti-Fragile Academy, established to develop and teach new approach to management. That takes full account of the needs for survival in our turbulent times. You can find out more about these links to the Academy uh, under the contributor section of the Transcending the Crisis website. He's also Managing Director of Services Limited. His most recent book, Building the Anti-Fragile Organization, Risk, Opportunity and Governance in a Turbulent World, was published by Gower in 2014. So it's been around for some time. He is currently right, working on a new book, uh, Time to Rethink Risk Management, Managing Through a Global Crisis. I wonder where you might have got the inspiration for that, Tony. <laughs> so Tony is also an international expert speaker, consultant and trainer with extensive experience in the fields of anti-fragility, quality management, organizational excellence, lean operations and Six Sigma. And a well-known invited keynote speaker at conferences and events. And that's why we are so happy to have him here today. So look, welcome, Tony, and good to have you here. Um, it's okay to call you Tony and not Professor Tony. It's, it? it's great to call me Tony. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so look, um, we're going to chat today about anti-fragile organisations. And I'm going to hold my hand up here and say to you that, look, I'm relatively new to this field of anti-fragile stuff. And you know, I suspect maybe some of the people out here listening might be this, the same way too. So my question to, to get us started would be is, you know, what makes a uh, an organization anti-fragile, uh, I say distinct from what Talib calls a fragile one? Okay, it's a good question. Uh, anti-fragility is the opposite of fragility. So fragility is something which is liable to damage easily when exposed to a shock or pressure of some kind. We think of robust as the opposite of uh, fragile, but robust is only strong up to a certain level. An anti-fragile organisation gets stronger by being stressed. So that's the basic concept. So why would an organisation be anti-fragile? Well, it's going to come down to people and leadership. And if I may, maybe I can share a couple of slides at this point. That might be a way in. Thank you, sir. So I'm going to share my screen, if I may, which I think should be happening now. Awesome. Awesome, indeed. So I think the thing about anti-fragility is it's got to be in all parts of the organisation. You're either fragile or you're anti-fragile in every dimension, every layer of the organisation. If you think of the Deloitte's layer model, then all those layers can be fragile or they can be anti-fragile or they can have aspects of both. But where we've got good leadership, where we've got learning, where we're aware of our environment and what's going on around us, where we've got good treatment of information, where we can take decisions well, where we are agile, where we're flexible, where we share risk and spread risk. In those circumstances, we've got the ability to get stronger from being stressed as an organisation. And I tend to think of organisations as somewhere between man-made systems and natural systems. Now, natural systems are naturally anti-fragile. Um, the idea of the cat with nine lives they can withstand stress. Um, but man-made systems tend to be fragile. They're only robust up to a certain level. We haven't really built this characteristic. And yet the people in our systems give us a certain level of anti-fragility for free. Uh, and if we use it right, if we design it, if we develop it, it means that we can run our organisations through the governance, the strategy, the structure, the systems, the culture on an anti-fragile basis. And that means we can then develop anti-fragility in what we do in our products, in our services. Now, it's quite interesting why we are fragile today, because we obviously are. Um, I, I took a copy of The Atlantic, a recent copy, 
um, which a nice little article by Edward Tenner talking about the fact that we are so efficient, that's what's making us fragile. Wow. One of the interesting things is high efficiency gives you fragility. It's obvious, isn't it? The more efficient you are, the more fragile you are. Just think mm. about going to see your medic, going to your doctor. Mm. If you've got a quarter of an hour slots and he gets one really difficult case, then the whole of the schedule is going to fall over. Mm. The more efficient, the more fragile we are. But of course, we've got a volatile environment as well. We've got bad governance, we've got bad processes, and we've got the problems of people. Fragile organisations don't know they're fragile. That's a lot of the problem. They think they're good. They're not open to change. An organisation which is complacent is fragile. And it's all very well talked about learning, but then we learn a lot of things and we don't use it. We try and tackle managing risk, but which organisation was ready for the crisis? None of them were ready for the crisis. We didn't manage risk right. We short term, we're bureaucratic, we manage change wrong, we focus on initiatives, we hide things, we are not transparent. And we have weak supply chains and we ignore our customers. And the weak supply chains, again, the crisis has really brought home to us and hits in the face. And you know what? The crisis wasn't exactly a surprise, was it? A couple of time from 2017 said we weren't ready for the next pandemic. It was that well known. We all knew at the beginning of the year what was going to happen when we looked at China. We all knew, of it as it spread, as we went into February, we all knew when it came locally by March, and it was only when it became a massive, overwhelming threat, when the grey rhinoceros had actually landed in our lap, that we even considered doing anything about it. So we weren't anti-fragile, we were desperately fragile. We weren't aware, we weren't responding, we weren't agile, we weren't getting stronger because we'd learned from previous pandemics. We were just a hater in the sand. Mm. You can test your fragility, of course, of your organisation. It's very basic things you think about, how you learn, how you use the information, what you do with the learning, how aware you are, etc. All that stuff is pretty straightforward. And obviously, you know, we can look at any organisation, we can do a survey, we can ascertain where the fragilities are, we can address them. But the truth of the matter is we don't tend to do that. But we should have before the crisis. So that's where we are now. Um, lots of ways we can become more anti-fragile. Um, don't think you're there. We're never there. Mm. Some awareness. Be joined up, nimble, keep learning, and avoid rigidity, ultra-efficiency, and rely on robustness. Don't automate, engage. Our anti-fragile systems, like risk management, audit, etc., are themselves fragile because of the way we've implemented them. Mm. They're easy to fall over for any unusual circumstances, as with a crisis. Diversity, a basic principle that we get from natural systems, gives us anti-fragility, but we tend to remove it in standardising centrally. And we need precautionary principles. Washing your hands. We don't exactly know what the threat is, but we know that washing your hands is a very good precaution. There are a lot of other good precautions against the pandemic that we didn't really put in place. We weren't alert. We didn't have, we didn't have an alert system ready. How often are small and stress tests? So all of these things are pretty good indicators. Now, I thought I'd just mention, in case no one else has, of course, that Mark Carney spoke relatively recently about the new world, the new normal. Um, we're entering a world in which firms would be expected to prepare for black swans by valuing anti-fragility and planning for catastrophe. I think that kind of sums it up, at least now, it is very obvious that we need it. So I hope that helps. Well, it's certainly given me a start, but I suppose, <laughs> you know, in, some, in some ways I've got more questions now than, than maybe oh, I should find, because maybe that's my, level of expertise but there's a number of things you know interesting to me here is it because that sounds like quite a rather high level statement from mr carney and i'm just wondering mm. yeah you know, what it is because you, you gave 10 things there and i'll tell you one thing i've noticed about leaders they they quickly get overwhelmed 
And you know, yeah, and, yeah. And I'll probably come to that question in a moment, probably end on that one about you know, what one thing would you offer them? So I'll let you think about that. But in the meantime, I'm very curious because it, it's one of these sort of um, discussions, debates, dialogues, you might say, that I'm having with other people a minute. And it's about how much stress is actually useful you know, to, to, to the organisation? Because it, it seems, uh, just from my observation, that we all seem to have collapsed in a heap. You know, um, is there too much stress? And yes, we knew it was happening, it was coming, but yet we didn't plan well enough for it. How much, how much stress is useful, Tony? Well, you know, the an analogy with natural systems is quite good because obviously when I exercise, I get stronger. If I try and do too much at once, I fall over, I have a cardiac arrest, and I de I'm dead. And that's exactly the issue, of course. You can't have too much stress at once, and you have to know how to channel and manage stress. And a good leader, I believe, will stress their organisation in a positive way, but will manage that stress and will not overwhelm the organisation with the stress. It's not only examples of that. How would you stress it in a positive way? Okay, it's not only how much. I just want to make the point. It's also Sorry. how you do it and, and the stress mm -hmm. in a positive way. So it's fairly obvious in the sense that at the basic level, we stress test banks all the time. And banks go through emergency um, simulations to a much greater extent than most other organisations in okay. order to deal with those situations. Now, we, we do do, it is true to say that we, we do do tabletop walkthroughs in organisations these days. We look at scenarios, but you know what? We could do a lot more of that. There's a lot of organisations perhaps that wish they had done a enterprise level tabletop exercise before the pandemic. It would have been extremely useful as to the impact of the pandemic on them. But it wasn't in the mindset. We were complacent. It, it's that grey rhinoceros charging at us again. We knew it was there, but we ignored it because our eyes, the way we see our, our, um, our standardised approach to risk management, for instance, stops us seeing the elephant in the room or the rhinoceros approaching us. Mm. So stress is very useful. So what sort of stress? Well, I would suggest that a good CEO will be taking parts of the business, parts of the organisation, and will be deliberately putting them through a cycle of stress, a timetable of stress. A board, if we get governance right, will be walking through the whole of the organisation, will be observing the whole of the organization over its annual cycle, because actually that's its responsibility. In the end, if an organization fails, it's the board's failure. In any way, it's the board's failure. So the board, if it was doing its job coherently, if it was working as a team rather than a group of individuals and representatives, representing the money and technical experts, would actually be observing, stepping through, exploring, pushing, prodding the organisation and dealing with what ifs. And it's that scenario looking, that wide open view, that mobilisation of the key resources at the top of the organisation, and the very often underutilised board, that I think is really important to the situation. The more we formalise it and ritualise it into the risk committee, for instance, and the risk committee steps through a version of risk management, in which all risks are treated as point events. We take, we take a risk of flooding the site as equivalent to the risk of a global epidemic. Mm. You don't see the difference in the way we treat them. No, no wonder we have problems. Yes. See, uh, there, there, there's such a big parallel here, Tony, because I know that when I've worked with organisations and you know, quite often work with the executive, Quite often the problem that I find is, is the board tend to get over involved in the day to day running of stuff they're, they're, and you know, for me, I, I would much prefer that they would do exactly as you suggested, but how, <laughs> how certainly as me as a, as a coach coming into your organization, how do I tell the board, get back in your box, you know, carry on doing what well, you, you said. You I want them in the box, but I want them to do more at that high level at the strategic exactly. level. Exactly. Yeah, because, because they're not spending too much time down here, they're not spending enough time up there. 
So but I'd like them to be up there more as a team. I'd like them to, between them, cover all dimensions, every aspect of the organization. If I took Deloitte's layer model as a structure, then I would like between them to be organizing how they keep their eyes open, how they keep that surveillance, that awareness across the whole of the internal and external environment in a way where they've got their own information sources and they're not relying on the executive for all their information to be processed mm. and pre-digested. So they have actually got the capacity to do what they're supposed to be there for as an independent source and not one which is constrained by the executive. Let's face it, we actually evaluate good executives as being able to control their boards. Now that's not a good trait. We need independence, we need that governance. Anti-fragile organisation has anti-fragile governance. Mm. Wow, yeah. You've got some light bulbs going off in my head here at the minute, Tony. It's just <laughs> really, really useful. Because again, it's this aspect of the board working as a team, because certainly my observation... They don't, the they don't. Members, they don't. Are not, they're not teams. No, they're right. a bunch of individuals. There is a board to create a team, I suggest, because the board yes. has a function, as a board. Yes. Interesting, very interesting. Hmm. Okay, so look, um, I'm just going to see if we've got any questions coming in. And uh, yeah, I, I know that I spotted um, a comment there that uh, some people are saying that uh, get, getting the leadership to stop seeing uh, wargaming scenario planning as a luxury activity. You know, again, there's, there's just no time for it. People don't give time for it, do they? So, so you're laughing there. It's a, probably a, an affirmation that that's the case, yeah? I think we've all seen it, of course, yes. Yeah. So look, um, here's a question actually from, from Scott Lewis. Um, are there fundamental structural changes needed in the traditional corporate structures? That's a really good question. So I think there are certain structures which need change, yes. Um, but I don't think we're necessarily talking about massive changes across the organisation, but we do need refreshment, and I think that is, um, that's the shake-up we need. We need new eyes, we need a new way of seeing things. So our problem, when we look at the organisation, is we're on tram lines in our way of thinking, mm. and we are at all levels of those tram lines from the top and even from the board downwards. So there are certain functions, I, I would say, probably need a good shake-up. Risk, I think, definitely needs a good shake-up. Mm. risk as something which is a sort of planning tool. It's about the future. We don't see risk as moving into the operational area. As for example, the hazards of a real pandemic materialize. We're not spanning the horizon, seeing it approaching, moving immediately into action and controlling it in real time. But we see a handover to business continuity people who are kind of the emergency managers, but they, they're only doing it for a relatively short period of time. And it's, it's not an even transition, it's a special status, it's a special period. So I think we need a much more integral approach to risk management and business continuity, which is absolutely inherent in the business. It's seen as an operational area, not just a planning or a compliance driven requirement because, because we might just need it sometime in any way it's regulatory. So I, I see that area, those areas are somewhat changing. I see the, the problem inside the organization that the vertical silos strongly restrict vision of the, both the internal and the external environment so that we can't really see the threats, we can't bring them together, we don't understand them, we can't interpret them in the way. Um, and, I, and I see that the board is therefore actually very useful if used properly or perhaps getting an overall picture of all of that. I see the need for um, senior functional leads, C-suite and downwards, the first reports to C-suite, to actually have a better understanding of the complete business rather than of their own specialist patch. It's great they're specialists, but they're also members of the executive team and it's that team as well that needs to operate under unusual circumstances, extreme circumstances in different ways. Mm. And I think the whole planning functions need to be 
probably moved on and different because they need to be able to plan in a way which we're allowing for many more possible circumstances than we tend to do. We tend to think about business as usual and slight changes, perturbations and go back to normal. And I think all this talk about new normal makes one think about much more that maybe we've got a whole cascade of new normals. We're in a very turbulent world now. As technology shifts and communication shifts and we're more joined up, that turbulence increases, becomes bigger and bigger, and the interconnectivity becomes more and more of a risk. And so thinking much more in terms of a cascade of new normals might be a better way forward. Of course, the new normal is a cascade of new normals, okay? <laughs> but nevertheless, I think it's a worldview that's possibly what needs to change. What's interesting, of course, is that the organizations that have got a, a view of a dynamic world, of a world that's changing, of a dynamic organization, are the ones that cope best with change. And that's what we need in all our organizations. We need a view of, as a living organism, we are observant of what's happening around us. We have senses of what's going on. We're ready for change. If we become rigid, we fail. We don't. Now, it's different in different markets, in different circumstances. Some of our areas are protected. It's different for government, but then government as well needs to now approach the new normal and a cascade of new normal. Mm. Well, then, I mean, there's, there's just so much in there. And um, it's, so just to sort of summarize an answer there, because, you know, um, in, in leaning on what some of Bill said in the previous section, it's about maybe how we do things differently in the organizations rather than shaking up the whole structure because it isn't maybe so much about the structure but about how we're responding either as individuals or teams i think structures if you think about structures they're the hardwired bit they're the human constructs structures are the bit in the organization which is like man-made systems like we make a vehicle or we make a product we have very clear rules and organizations are like that they have clear rules and things but the anti-fragile nature of what happens in an organization comes from the people and is usually associated with the soft systems with the culture with the motivation with the ability to respond people are both the weak point in the system and the and the savior of the system simultaneously and that means it's very much about the people and it's about us. And I'm not so sure it's so much about how we do things and how we see things, but it's about a new mindset that we're facing, which is our responsibility and our role. We're part of the brain of this, and particularly more senior we are, part of the nervous system, the brain of this living organism, which is the organization. We're responsible for its survival and its growth and its development and we're good at the upside of that but we are not particularly good necessarily at the downside we've been appointed for the upside by and large mm. that's our strength but we're not particularly good at the downside and when the world changes dramatically around us are we ready for are we equipped for have we got the world view adequate to deal immediately with how we need to respond mm. and I think we need to be better at doing that. We need to think of our structures as much more fluid and that they can be changed. And we need to be able to change them in, in very quickly and get them right pretty fast. They don't necessarily have to be perfect when we do change them, but they do have to be pretty perfect pretty soon after that if we're not going to get ourselves into more serious trouble. Mm. So I think it's a different approach to the view of the organization because we've seen organizations are slowly changing, almost rigid or, or, um, things where the, we didn't talk very much about the soft side, the sort of compensation for that that was created by the people. But if we take the integrated hard soft view of the system, then we need to design in those soft elements. Mm. We need some rules in the hard wiring of the system which enable us to have the authority, the power to make those changes happen when we actually need them to happen. Hmm. Okay, well look Tony, as I say, my, my mind's spinning with a lot of this information just now and we, we've only got about four or five minutes left, so <laughs> I was wondering if 
yeah, because we won't, I don't think there's that many more questions. I see there's lots of actual comments going on in the chat, but um, I'd have to put my glasses on to read all that. So, uh, so I'm probably going to put that to one side. <laughs> but what I'd like to do is to ask you one question, and the question I'm going to ask all of the, uh, my guests today would be, what one thing then would you recommend to any leader in an organisation that they could do on Monday morning that's a practical, pragmatic, implementable, actionable thing to do that can help to make their organization more anti-fragile? It's going to be a bit of a long answer, but even though I've only got a few minutes. So and you've I, got four minutes. <laughs> I know, I know. So the, it's long, not so much in how long it takes, it's in the stages of it. So I think I said uh, before, I mean, I put the slides up, that the problem with fragile organizations is they don't know they're fragile. Mm -hmm. But fragility comes from complacency to a large extent and awareness of the environment and the threat, both internal and external. So the first thing I think a chief exec needs to do is to question all their own assumptions, all their own fixed points in their mindset of where things are, and then they need to, as a good leader, teach their first reports to do exactly the same thing. And they need to develop that as a team this questioning, this awareness, this what ifs, this con constant consideration of the environment around them. So everything is a working hypothesis. It may work for now, but everything is open to question. Everything is open to challenge. When it came to it, we did some things in this crisis that I never thought we'd see being done. And some of them are done very speedily and very well. And you know what, above everything else, we forgot about, we forgot about money for a bit, didn't we? That was really the most interesting aspect. Organisations mm. dropped talking about money, dropped focusing on money for a while, governments did too, and instead focused on human aspects, human things. Yeah, health. People, health. Mm. Now, it seems to me, this questions as a number of assumptions about how we see firms, Mm. At least in periods, the objectives can shift and the whole mindset of what we're pursuing and how we work and everything around us can be questioned and change. And if he's there, as a supreme leader, in a sense, within the organisation, has got a leadership job to steer us, to read what's happening, to see it in a broader context. And that's the way I suppose I see it. Yeah, it's a lovely place to leave it, Tony, because you know it, it's about having that view about leadership that that's exactly what we'd expect from our leaders. Whereas I think that's been somewhat lacking. So well, it's dynamic leadership. I don't yeah. think many leaders have had the opportunity in a less turbulent environment to be that sort of leader. This is mm. the great opportunity for real leadership to appear in our organisations. It's a great opportunity for leaders to come forward. It's a new type of leadership. It's a gift in the crisis, then. Yes. Yeah, it's a gift. That's right. awesome. awesome. Well, Tony, look, thank you so much for giving your time and really appreciate this conversation. Like I say, my, my head's starting to hurt now. So uh, I'm going to have to take a few deep breaths before I get on with my next uh, chat. So, look, thank you again Great. for your time. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. No worries. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.